Hello, my name is Alan Prost, and I'm talking to you today about pressure support ventilation. This is part of Module 4 PowerPoint slides in the course of RESP 220. Pressure support is probably one of the most important modes we're going to discuss in this, in this module. It's a very important mode because it allows the patients to spontaneously breathe continuously throughout the ventilatory cycle while augmenting their efforts. And this is critically important because this optimizes their ventilation to perfusion relationships. Often the patient can um, be breathing with their diaphragm and utilizing their normal muscles of inspiration so they maintain more muscle tone. Plus, physiologically, they are creating negative interthoracic pressure, pressures rather than positive pressures during the mechanical breath. Thus, they have more normal physiological distribution of ventilation and uh, the uh, and allowing perfusion to occur in the lungs. So this is a very important mode. So let's take a look at it. Pressure support. It's a spontaneous breathing mode. The patient is doing all of the breathing and controlling all elements of the breath. What the mode is doing and what the ventilator is doing is augmenting their effort. All right. So this is a purely spontaneous mode. So the patient has total control over the uh, all elements of the breath. And yet um, it can often be combined with other modes like IMV so that you can have some um, mandatory or assisted breaths and allow the patient to spontaneously breathe but control their work of breathing with each breath that they're getting. So that's a huge advantage. The way we control the work of breathing is by setting the inspiratory pressure level or the pressure support level. That's what controls the breathing. So an increased pressure support level and the numbers I'm talking about are usually anywhere from about 8 to maybe 12 to maybe 15 centimeters of water pressure. This would be considered low pressure support. This would be considered high level of pressure support. All right. We, of course, will adjust the PEEP and FIO2 and the sensitivity to make sure that it's working correctly and meeting the patient's needs. So the patient determines their respiratory rate, TI, and inspiratory flow. So they have total control over the breath, but their work of breathing will be decreased dramatically. That's the key element of this breath, is that it decreases the work of breathing. And we control that with their pressure support level set. Okay, so let's look at this more closely. It's usually called pressure support ventilation. All right, Some, it, uh, the nomenclature is a little unsure on this, but pressure control... CSV is considered pressure support ventilation. Some people will add this little adjunct on the end to make it very clear what mode we're talking about and compare to it just straight pressure um, to separate out from pressure control ventilation. All right, because what it does is quite a bit different than pressure control. Okay, so key thing about this mode is that you have to have a patient who's capable of spontaneously breathing. Okay, they have to have a demonstrated ability to maintain their uh, minute ventilation, at least triggering the ventilator, if they have an intact ventilatory drive, which means that they're usually conscious and um, coherent. Okay? They don't, um, the, the, the caveat is, of course, if they need full ventilatory support, then you're not going to choose this mode. But if they need partial ventilatory support, in other words, their work of breathing is high, but we can help them by augmenting their own inspiratory efforts, this is an excellent choice. All right? Sometimes if they're being weaned from the ventilator, um, we'll use a mode like this to determine their ability to spontaneously breathe. And we can do that by setting up um, a small level of pressure support, say plus five, six, or seven, to take over the work of breathing through the endotracheal tube. All right? The patient determines the tidal volume and respiratory rate on their own. It's up to them what they need for minute ventilation, and they're responding to their own CO2 levels in their body and determining what their body requires for minute ventilation, all right? So key thing here is the patient must have an intact ventilatory drive, all right? That's a critical element of this mode, all right? So patient sets their own rate, TI and inspiratory flow and tidal volume. So it's very comfortable. In fact, most patients hardly know they're on the mechanical ventilator. What we're doing is we're augmenting their inspiratory own inspiratory efforts. So we're just increasing the effectiveness of their breathing. So it augments the patient's tidal volume. And I really like that term to describe this. That is, it's an augmentation mode. All right. Increasing the pressure support level will uh, often increase the tidal volume because if the patient maintains the same effort, the ventilator's amount of augmentation will increase and increase tidal volume. So if a patient has a high respiratory rate and a low tidal volume, increasing the level of pressure support will alleviate that problem.
It can be used in conjunction with other modes such as volume control CMV or point volume control IMV, pressure support or pressure control IMV. It's often an adjunct so that those spontaneous breaths in between the um, assisted or controlled breaths will have some augmentation and the ventilator, will, the patient won't be doing all of the work of breathing on those spontaneous breaths. So it allows a patient a bridging, if you will, um, between full work of breathing and um, partial work of breathing so that they're using their own muscles. So it allows the patient to have like a variable effort, if you will. So it's like uh, muscle training. You can start them off where the muscles doing a very small amount of work and increasing the workload depending on what the patient needs. All right. The disadvantages is that it cannot be used on a patient with an inconsistent or an irregular ventilatory drive. So say a patient who's coming in with um, uh, um, a head injury or a patient coming out of the OR who may be receiving a large amount of pain medication where they're drifting in and out of unconsciousness, this would not be the mode to use for either one of those kinds of patients. All right. Clearly, we can set up alarms and warn us if an apnea occurs, but if we are uh, consider, think that apnea is possible, this wouldn't be an appropriate mode. We can go one of the IMV modes, something like that. Okay, so let's look at the mechanics. Well, the trigger, it can be patient only. There's no time trigger in this mode. If the patient stops breathing, they don't get anything. This only augments their own inspiratory effort. So it can be by pressure or flow, depending on the type of manufacturer of ventilator. The limit it's always a pressure limit. And so it, a lot of people get this mixed up with pressure control. They think it looks and is very similar to pressure control, but it's unique in its own way. Now, here's the uniqueness is that it's flow cycled. It's not cycled to time. It's cycled to flow. And the flow we're talking about is the natural decline in a patient's own inspiratory flow. So when you and I breathe in, we take a breath. It starts off with a high flow rate and it slowly comes down. And it the ventilator cycles as we have this decline in inspiratory flow all right so it can and we can vary where that's going to occur that's one of the unique aspects of this mode i can set it say for a, an incline a decline in peak inspiratory flow to 25 percent or say 50 percent or say just even 10 percent of the uh, inspiratory flow all right it's considered to be patient cycled and that's because this flow, this inspiratory flow, is determined by the patient. If they take a high inspiratory flow or a low inspiratory flow, they're in control. All right. Sometimes we can set up a time element to this in case there's leaks in the system or other things so that the breath won't go on for too long. Because if they, the ventilator couldn't uh, interpret this decline in inspiratory flow, it might just stay in on in the inspiratory phase. So we set up a time cycling element just for emergencies. All right. So how does this look when we combine it with these other modes? All right. Well, let's first look at our setting. The pressure support level, generally it's going to be low if we want the patient to do lots of work of breathing. All right. We can set it higher and a high is high. I'm talking about 12 to maybe 15 centimeters of water pressure would be considered a high level of pressure support. A low level would probably be somewhere between seven and eight centimeters of water pressure. Okay, and anything lower than that, and we're probably just overcoming some of the work of breathing through the endotracheal tube. The patient will be doing almost all of a normal work of breathing of a breath. Clearly, we're going to set up a PEEP level. Um, a good place to be is plus five, but it depends on what the patient needs. FO2, depending on what the patient needs, and of course, we'll need a sensitivity set. All right. And some of these nuances of how this is going to be set up is ventilator specific. So let's not concern ourselves too much about that. All right. The pressure support level determines the work of breathing of the patient. So here's our pressure supported breath, and it looks very much like a pressure controlled breath. All right. But let me point out some of the unique aspects of this. One, it's always going to be patient triggered. All right. So that's the first thing. So it's patient triggered. And then, of course, yes, it's going to be. Um, pressure limited, just like in pressure control, all right? But the key thing here is how it's cycling off, all right? It's always flow cycled, all right? And that's very different because in, in uh, pressure control, it was always time cycled. And what's happening here, as the patient takes a spontaneous breath in, they create a high inspiratory flow, and then as the inspiratory flow declines to some point, and it's often 25% 
of the peak inspiratory flow. I'm just using that as an example. Many ventilators now we can adjust this. So if this is 100% or the highest peak inspiratory flow, when it declines to 25 liters per, or 25% of that, all right, then the ventilator would cycle into exhalation. So we're never going to see that inspiratory pause. We're never going to see the pressure held in the lungs. We'll never see equal distribution of the breath because the flow is only on during inspiration. That's a key factor. The flow is only maintained as the patient spontaneously breathing in during inspiration. As soon as they start to relax their inspiratory efforts and the ventilator senses that decline and so that's what we have here, a decline in spontaneous breathing, the uh, spontaneous inspiration, the ventilator cycles into exhalation. So that's a key element of this mode, all right? So I'm just showing out the key elements here and that this decline in inspiratory flow is what causes the ventilator to cycle. So it looks very similar to pressure control, but it's not. All right, this is not pressure control. The pressure at the mouth is only supplied during the patient's spontaneous inspiratory efforts. So as they stop breathing in, the ventilator cycles off. So this really is spontaneous breathing and only augments during the patient's own inspiratory efforts. The P mouth is positive, but the P alveoli is negative during inspiration. We know GEV true positive pressure ventilation here because the patient must be breathing in for while this mode is being triggered on. As soon as they stop breathing in, we go into a normal expiratory phase. All right. Thus, worker breathing is reduced, but it's more physiologically similar to spontaneous breathing than regular positive pressure ventilation. Okay, let's take a look at how this looks like. Okay, so once again, We've got our little diagrams here, and you're getting very familiar with these, I would think, by now. So the patient triggers the breath, all right? And uh, to trigger the ventilator, what's happening, and this is our alveolar pressure, so this is what's happening in the lungs. We create a negative pressures inside the lungs because we're breathing in, just like we do spontaneously, all right? So as long as this negative spontaneous breath is occurring, we're taking that breath in and creating negative uh, pressures within the lung, the flow between the mouth and the or the ventilator and the patient will be triggered on. So the flow will be going into the lungs. But as soon as the patient starts to relax and their inspiratory effort declines a little bit, the flow will start to decelerate and start to slow down. And once it gets down to about 25% of that initial peak inspiratory flow, the ventilator goes into exhalation. Now you might remember from AMPH 221 that this alveolar waveform like this is exactly what we'd expect to see in a spontaneous breathing patient. But what's dramatically different is because of we've got this uh, P mouth pressure set here and that's really what's happening. This is the pressure in the mouth circuit. We only need a very small amount of negative um, pressure in the lungs to create a large volume change. All right, so this element is what augments this pressure gradient between the mouth pressure and the lung pressure. This pressure gradient in here establishes the amount of augmentation. All right, so if we set a high level of pressure support, we've got a huge amount of augmentation. If we set a low level of pressure support, we have a little bit of augmentation, and that's how we can control the work of breathing. So let's compare this now to a regular pressure controlled breath, right? which looks dramatically different. All right, Here's our pressure controlled breath. We've got the patient triggered the ventilator, but now what's happened, as soon as the patient triggered the ve ventilator, the alveolar pressures are brought into the positive realm, all right? because the ventilator is going to shoot pressure into the lungs and maintain that pressure. So even though there's some flow here occurring. Of course, this is due to the patient's lung characteristics. You notice we have that um, inspiratory pause where the pressure in the mouth or the pressure in the, the ventilator circuit and the pressures in the alveoli are equal. All right, This did not happen during pressure support because as soon as the inspiratory flow declines, what happens in, ins in pressure support? The ventilator cuts out. All right, So the amount of volume 
delivered by in this mode in pressure control is directly related to the amount of pressure delivered to the alveoli all right so this is true positive pressure ventilation well let's compare them side by side now all right and here's the difference is that in our um, pressure supported breath and in, ideally of course in our pressure supported breath during the inspiratory phase the alveolar pressure is slightly negative so this is a lot like a normal spontaneous breath where in pressure control breath the pressures in the alveoli are positive so we have a positive pressure ventilation this is normal physiologically that's the target and of course this is regular positive pressure ventilation so even if the patient's unconscious we would be ventilating them and receiving a minute ventilation here if the patient doesn't make this inspiratory effort there'll be no volume or flow delivered to the patient whatsoever all right if they make a really small inspiratory effort and then they allow them to go into exhalation right away then only a very small short volume of breath will be delivered to the patient all right so the patient's entirely in control with the mode of pressure support the duration of even TI is determined by the patient. I've made this look very much like a pressure control breath, but if the patient takes a long breath in, so big, long, deep sigh, they'll get a very long TI. It's up to them. They'll determine how long they maintain this low or this inspiratory effort. If they take a short breath, they'd only get a very small amount of tidal volume and the pressure being held at the mouth would only be held for a short period of time. All of these elements are controlled by the patient all right that is a key factor in the mode of pressure control sorry about the way the little pen's working today all right so pressure support is a fantastic mode to augment a patient's um, spontaneous breathing efforts all right so that's in a critical spontaneous breathing efforts are the critical thing if you use a high level of pressure support we're going to augment these a lot to decrease the work of breathing all right if we use a low level of pressure support the patient will still be doing a fair amount of work of breathing or it can actually be a normal amount of work of breathing the ventilator only cycles on as the patient's breathing in so thank you very much